Thank for the introduction. Hello, everyone. Uh, today, we will give a talk about introduction to Apache Airflow. Uh, this talk is uh, mostly covering base ideas behind the Airflow. We will not show you how to use Airflow. We will just cover uh, what Airflow is, and this should help you to understand how it works. Uh, so, uh, about us, as Mara mentioned, uh, I'm Tomek Kurbaszek, and I'm a software engineer in the Polydia, which is Warsaw-based uh, software house. And since June, I'm working on Apache Airflow on a daily basis, and since December, I'm official Apache Airflow commenter. Mm -hmm. So, I'm, I introduce myself, uh, buenos dias. Is it correct? <laughs> yeah, I think so. Uh, um, so my name is Jarek. Uh, I'm a PMC member, as Mara mentioned, but not every PMC is like active committer. I'm also active committer and, and make a lot of commits every day <laughs> to Apache Airflow. Uh, I started my adventure, and I would say this is an adventure, with Apache Airflow uh, almost two years ago. Two years will be in, in, you know, in August, so like two months from now. Uh, and after half a year, more or less, I became a committer. I was invited to be committer, uh, similarly as Tomek. And then after another seven months, I was invited to be PMC member, which is kind of uh, strange because you have uh, a lot of responsibility, uh, but no power. <laughs> so PMC doesn't mean that you have more power than any other committer. Uh, yeah, so that's uh, that's about it, and I think we can continue about. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, so to give you some more context uh, about the Apache Airflow team in Poldia, we have uh, currently six person, and we are probably one of the most active commuters in the community in the last few months, like year. Uh, there, there was a, a few, few more people, but they are decided to to uh, leave the project. At Polydia, but they are still working at the company. Uh, and today we will talk firstly about the Apache Airflow. Uh, we'll cover shortly the history of Apache Airflow and where it originated from. Then we will give you uh, Airflow 101, uh, where we will cover the basic definition and concept be behind the Airflow, including DAG, operators, hooks, executors, and probably the most important part, scheduler. Uh, we'll also mention in the meantime the web UI. And in the second part of the talk, we will uh, cover the, we will answer a few questions. First, when to use Airflow, uh, and probably most importantly, when Airflow is not the best choice. And uh, then we will shortly talk about the Kubernetes spot operators, especially for heavy load workloads. Then about making customer integration with external services. And lastly, about contribution, because Apache Airflow is an open source product and everyone can contribute. Yeah. And now Yarek will introduce the Airflow. Yeah. Uh, just, uh, yeah, I will, I will tell about like, what Airflow is. You can see this, this wonderful logo here on, uh, on my, on my t-shirt. Uh, but I'll, I'll tell more about that. Uh, it's not only the logo, it's much more than that. Uh, but uh, if you have any questions during our talk, uh, you can ask them on the chat, uh, uh, and we can, we can we'll try to answer them. We can, we'll be able to also answer questions uh, afterwards uh, on on Slack uh, uh, of uh, SG Virtual. Um, so uh, feel free to ask the questions. We are we are the two of us. So once one of that one of us is speaking, the other can answer the questions, which makes it very easy for us uh, to to do the presentation. So what Airflow is. Uh, I'm uh, kind of repeating myself um, every time when I'm talking about that, but I'm an ex I, I I used to sing in a choir for 30 years. Uh, and uh, and I very know very well know uh, uh, the like how it is when you have a conductor. Uh, the conductor is there in front of you uh, when you make the concert when you sing. Uh, the conductor pretty much does nothing. Like it's just just waves the hands and uh, uh, well of course there is a lot of preparation and stuff before but but conductor just merely is there to synchronize actions of all the people who are actually doing the work and this is what airflow is so airflow is is, is merely a, a conductor 
of all the other services that that it communicates to the services that are that are there for um, data processing. So Airflow is really focusing on data processing and particularly on processing of batch data intervals. So intervals which are for specific uh, range of time, like a day, an hour, or 15 minutes. And it is like repeated. So every 15 minutes you have a, a bunch of data to process. And then Airflow uh, can invoke all the services around uh, on this particular data interval uh, or interval of data, actually. Uh, but Airflow doesn't do much on its own. It merely tells, like, do this, do that. When this happens, this should happen, etc. So it, 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 it's really an orchestrator or conductor uh, of the orchestra of all the data processing tools that you can imagine. Um, what Airflow, uh, may, what makes Airflow different from many other similar solutions, because there are many workflow, uh, more workflow solutions available. Uh, so this Airflow is first of all a pure Python. Uh, as a data scientist, you are uh, usually very much into the, the Python programming. Like you know Python very well. Most of data scientists do that, uh, and most of programmers do know Python. Python is like becoming a most popular language ever. And uh, Apache Airflow is all about Python. Everything in Airflow is written in Python. Everything you uh, work with, like the way you work with uh, with Airflow, you write the Python code. You don't write uh, descriptions of your workflows in some different language. You write them in Python. In the, when you want to communicate with some external service, you write a Python operator or hook. That's, these are the names that are used in Airflow. Uh, and everything is in Python. So you don't have to leave your favorite tools, uh, IDEs. Uh, you know the language that you are programming with, that you are used to when you automate your stuff. Um, and you don't have to learn anything new to use uh, Airflow and to be productive in Airflow. You just have to know Python. That's pretty much it. And as I mentioned before, workflows are defined as Python files, not as XML files, not as YAML files, where you explain how, what are the tasks and operators and how they communicate with each other. It is all Python code, Python objects that interact with each other. Uh, data intervals, I already told about that. Uh, and one thing, like uh, Airflow is, is, is literally a, a cron job. Yeah, like, can you imagine, okay, Cram drop is easy. Yeah? Like just specify the, the time, how often it runs, uh, while it runs a script. Yeah? Uh, and that's how it starts. So, so usually when uh, when you start working with the data processing small, uh, then you write a bunch of uh, bash scripts which are executed with cron drops. Uh, and these cron drops are like they are getting more and more of them. Uh, then you start thinking, okay, after this cron drop finishes, I want to start another one. How do I do that so that it the one waits for each other. Then you write some more complex bash scripts. And finally, you find out in the place that that, that, that actually, actually that, that usually happens, and that's how Airflow uh, that how Airflow was born. Like when you have a lot of those bash scripts and a lot of those cron jobs to, to manage, you just start losing uh, your uh, uh, your pe not not even patience or sanity. You, yeah, because you have to manage that, or, or you have more and more people managing it, and it's it's it's, an, it's usually a nightmare. And Airflow solves this problem in the way that you can manage hundreds and or thousands of workflows and dependencies between tasks in a very nice way that is super easy to uh, to uh, to manage on one hand. So you, you have people who manage this work manage the, those workflows. On the other hand, it's very easy to to write the uh, the workflows themselves, and many people can write the workflows, uh, and like one person can uh, operate or manage operations of all those workflows. And so this is basically like if if you think about Airflow, like which problems a uh, problem Airflow solves, it's exactly this problem. Like when you have unmanageable set of data processing job uh, jobs, and you want you would like to manage them from one place in a consistent way, managed by one person or like small team and you have lots of people contributing to your uh, data processing workflows, that's where Airflow is really good. Uh, yeah, you can de define relations between the tasks in Python again, 
Uh, and one thing, which is something that we both with Tomek work a lot on and the whole team of ours, is to make uh, Airflow much more um, easy to start with and to, to start small. So we can war run war uh, Airflow with the same DAGs that you define, so those uh, the workflows. Uh, we will tell about DAGs in a moment. So with the same workflows, you can run them locally on your machine and debug them locally. Uh, and you can scale it to a number of machines if you have lots of them. And then you can even run them in the cloud if you want, because there are some cloud services and companies that provide cloud ser uh, Airflow as a service. So, so you can go from like being uh, one person just developing stuff uh, uh, on your own and testing it with Airflow, and move the same uh, workflows uh, up to the, the the full scale. And this is this is this is fantastic that Airflow does it because and and we we put a lot of effort to uh, in, because the experience of scale was there in Airflow from the very beginning, uh, and but we just came when we came two years ago. We, we invested a lot into making this like experience of a single de uh, developer, somebody who is iterating with the code, uh, much easier as well. Uh, and, and Airflow is, is getting there. As I mentioned before, there are other, you probably know the names, and those are the best comparisons to Airflow. So those are, those are different different workflow engines um, that you might heard of and maybe even used. Um, and they are for different purposes. So like every one of them is is different. So people think that workflow uh, uh, workflow is like workflow, and you, you can have any tool to manage whatever workflow, which is not necessarily true. Uh, like Airflow has its strength in this like data intervals, uh, Python approach, uh, being close to data scientists, uh, where other workflows has, have other advantages which Airflow might not have. So uh, so we will tell you more later what, what are the use cases which are really good for Airflow and, and where you should start thinking about that. Uh, a few words about history. So it originated in Airbnb, uh, or actually some people say in Facebook because people brought the idea from Facebook to Airbnb and Airbnb developed it. Then uh, Airbnb donated uh, this, uh, the Airflow to Apache Software Foundation in 2017. And it was incubating there. Uh, uh, Apache Software Foundation has this nice incubation process that that, that uh, projects grow up and become top level projects. And that's what happens happened to Airflow. Uh, it grew up. That were we already were. Uh, I was already contributing to Airflow by that time, uh, so I witnessed uh, graduation of Airflow. Uh, and Airflow is used by many companies. There are just a few here. There are more than 300 of them uh, right now officially, or even 400 now, officially at the Airflow uh, GitHub. You can see the list of people, companies who are using, which are using Airflow. So the, the big ones are here. Uh, Polydia, our company on, on the right. We are not users, actually we are contributors. So we are contributing to Airflow. We are not actually a data processing company, we are a software house. So we are a bit different than the other companies because we are uh, we are actually we actually don't process much data. Uh, we we uh, we just pro provide the uh, programming support uh, for the infrastructure for Airflow itself and and make it better uh, for others to run a lot of data with it. But we don't do that. So there are also other companies like Astronomer and Google Cloud. They are providing uh, Airflow as a service. Uh, Google Cloud provides Composer, Astronomer has an Astronomer Airflow, um, and, uh, and, and lots of companies using it, and big ones. Now to Tomek about Airflow Basic. Uh, yes, so let's start with the, the definition of a DAG. DAG is a directed acyclic graph, and this means that we have a graph with no cycles. And uh, this is the base of the Airflow workflow. Uh, so we have a graph. Uh, this graph consists of tasks uh, and relations between those tasks. So defining those relationships uh, between tasks is really powerful because we can set up a downstream relation uh, which will make the uh, task T6, for example, that will be executed after T5 is uh, successful. Or we can uh, define the upstream relation, which is uh, the, the opposite to the downstream. The 
interesting part is that we can also define the rules like execute on success, execute on the failure. So we can define a lot of complex uh, branching in our workflow. So we can do uh, take a decision based on some data which happens in the part of the, our work. And here is the definition of the workflow as a Python code. So as you can see, we are defining the DAG in the context, context manager with the, the DAG ID. And then we define those tasks uh, invoking the operators, which are just Python classes, which require some input, uh, but this will cover it uh, shortly. And then we define those relations between tasks. So in this example, we see that task one has to be succeeded to run the task two and task three. And if task three succeeds, then we will run task four and five. And if task five succeeds, then we will run the task six. So this is really a uh, powerful uh, tool to, to, to define all those uh, relationships. The interesting thing is that you can use everything that is in Python, including for loops, while loops, data time objects, and things like that. So you can dynamically create your workflows, for example, running, uh, doing a for loop over users and creating one operator for each user. Uh, so this is, this is really a uh, good option. Uh, yes, so now when we have those relations and we are running this DAG, uh, we can, it can happen that task three has failed and then all tasks that are in the downstream of the task three will fail also due to the uh, failed upstream. But one of the interesting uh, features of the Airflow is the uh, possibility to run a backfill, uh, which allow us to rerun the DAG uh, for the same interval and rerun only the tasks that were failed. So for example, in this case, if we have uh, task one, which was, which was processing a lot of data, like few gigabytes, and it took 15 minutes and leave somewhere the data, we don't want to repeat this task because it has succeeded. The effect is visible. What we want to do is to just repeat the task free. And running the backfill will use the uh, result of task one for a given interval and just run the task free using the data uh, generated previously. But to, to make it successful, one of the most important thing about the operators and developing the operators is that we have to assert that the operators, operators operations are item positive. And that means that the operation for a given interval of data will be executed and there will be created result. And if we will rerun the operation for the same data, then we will use already existing data or create new. So we are doing a check. Like, for example, if a cluster, for example, Hadoop cluster exists, we want to reuse it, not create one more cluster with the same name, same parameters in this case. So it's really important to remember about idempotence because without that, the airflow back will, will not work. And here is uh, how the uh, DAG look like in the uh, Airflow web UI. Uh, the web UI, I think, is the uh, it's functional. It doesn't look best, but uh, we believe that uh, we will improve this maybe later this year. But it works. Uh, it really helps users to manage the DAGs, to, to see the states of the tasks, to rerun them, and things like that. So now Yarek will uh, tell us uh, what can be a task. And uh, the answer is very simple. Is task is a is a Python object, really? Um, and uh, yeah, the, the the statement is is, is quite right. The task can be anything. It's pure Python, which means that you have all the flexibility of writing any any kind of code that you want to make your task and make any, any kind of logic that you want, uh, any kind of 
complex interaction uh, or complex uh, algorithms or whatever you need, you could write, you can write it in Python and make it a task. And there are different kinds of tasks in Airflow, though that they are not really separated by any uh, you know, formal uh, separation. It's just the, the type of job that those tasks are, are doing. So one thing is like an action uh, task. An action task can, uh, for example, set up a piece of infrastructure, like create Hadoop cluster, for example. This, this, this task is, is really, uh, this kind of tasks, they are there to prepare your environment for running. This is especially useful for cloud uh, infrastructure, where you don't necessarily want to always keep your clusters or your um, services running. You can set them up before you start, at the beginning of the workflow, then do all the processing, and then at the end of the workflow, you want to kill them. And that's where action tasks uh, are important and, and useful. Another thing is uh, transfer. And uh, as in many ETL or any data processing jobs, usually, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I'm repeating that from for many years because I actually started working on kind of ETL processing 20 years ago at my first job. Uh, and it hasn't changed much since, like the tools has changed. There was no airflow at this time. Airflow is wonderful, but the principles are the same. So you usually take data from one source and uh, somehow process it and put it in a, another destination. Uh, that's that's usually what uh, lots of steps in, in workflows uh, do this. This is the transfer in the ETL. Uh, uh, or transform actually, uh, but transfer operators they move data from one source to another, and this can be done either uh, in the operator that's like by Airflow, and that's where Airflow starts doing some tasks, some some work because it takes the data from one place and sends it to another, or uh, it can invoke uh, external transfer service, for example, like S3 to GCS. There is a ready-to-use service that you use. You just have to tell them, tell the service, okay, transfer me this file from here and put it there and wait for the result. And uh, these are the two types of transfer operators we have. And the third one is sensor. And sensor is, um, uh, is uh, waiting for kind of external trigger to come and, and it can make the workflow go farther. So I kind of, like, it's not a manual entry, but like entry like from pops up, queue, notification or whatever, or file appearing in a, in a bucket that can trigger action. Okay, now we are ready to do further processing. So these are the, the, the types of things. Also going back to action a little bit. So action can also be like invoke some heavy processing on like uh, Flink or Flink cluster or or um, any kind of or or an start start the processing beam Apache beam or whatever. So like th these these are actions that you can also invoke externally and wait for it to happen. So this is this is also another action that can happen. Um, uh, Airflow starts with some general purpose operators. Uh, and that's also like big powerful part of Airflow that you can, uh, if you want, if you don't have a specialized operator to talk to a particular service, you can always write your own in, in Bash or Python, or you can uh, have a Docker image, um, container image that you can run, or you can have a pod in Kubernetes that you can start to do whatever you want. And and you can use those operators in whatever way you want, and, and, and that's super flexible. Uh, but also, and this is this is where real power of uh, yeah I'll, I'll show it. So the real power of Airflow is that okay, it takes time to write those operators, and you have to know uh, if you want to use Bash or Python or Docker, you have to know what you are doing in terms of you have to know the service you are communicating with. But th the other types of operators they are specialized, and they take all the heavy lifting off of you. You don't have to know how to communicate with the service. You don't have to uh, understand uh, how to communicate, how to wait, how to interact with it. The, the specialized operators uh, interact directly with the service that you want to talk to, like data proc submits part of the job, for example. You don't, you're not, you don't have to know how to do it. It's just an operator and you configure it. You say, okay, start this job with these parameters, something, and, and when it runs, it actually does what it is supposed to do submit Spark jobs and you don't care how it is done underneath. It's done for you. And we have hundreds, literally hundreds of operators to, to talk to different services, those services that you can see on the right. 
Um, and uh, yeah, just a fun, fun, fun fact, which we've learned the day before yesterday, because like part of our job uh, is uh, was for two years to write operators uh, because our customers just wanted to have more operators to talk to their services, particularly Google Cloud Platform because that's what our customers were really interested in. Uh, and uh, after this uh, two, one and a half years, uh, we have 66% of the operators in Airflow are, are Google Cloud Platform operators. However, there are hundreds of other operators. So we have really a lot of Google Cloud Platform operators, but we have also plenty of others. Um, great, How? what's the internal of operator? It's, it's not much. As they mentioned, it's an object. It has a constructor, as every object in, in Python. And it can have pre-executed, post-execute method, which is optional, but the, the gist of it is like execute method. That's it. You just have to have an object which implements execute method. And the, uh, it's uh, derived from base operator, and that's it. And then this execute method can do whatever you want. The only, ex the only requirement is there. It's like this operator, this execute method has to be idempotent, something that Tomek mentioned. So in, if the same interval of data is re-executed again, it should provide you the same output. So or either overwrite the output or just find out that it's already been running and don't do anything. You shouldn't be able to like duplicate the data. It shouldn't, it shouldn't do that. Because that's the prerequisite for being able to manage and do, do the backfill, whatever, at any point in time that you want. Mm. Now, uh, back to Tomek about like communication of the operators with the external world. Yeah, so uh, we know that uh, Airflow is integrates with a lot of uh, external services. So the question is how we do this. And the first uh, idea behind this is hooks. And hooks uh, are like classes which could be thought of like a repository of common methods to communicate with the external API. Uh, the hooks are a thin layer over the API and the idea behind making them as thin as possible is to allow users use existing API docs. So the existing documentation and existing examples should allow users to start using Airflow operators and hooks. Uh, so uh, the hooks also should provide authorization ex exception handling, because if we will do this in the hook, then uh, we don't have to repeat ourselves in the operators. And as we can see, uh, when we have the my API service, which is external API, then we have my hook, which communicates with the API, and then we have my operator, which is utilizing the hook. So the operator doesn't communicate uh, directly with the API, it's done by uh, via the hook. Yeah. And to, make, uh, so to, to show you a more concrete example, uh, for example, we have uh, cluster control clients of uh, Google Data Proc library written in Python, and it implements uh, three methods, uh, create cluster, get cluster, and delete cluster. So if you want to add an integration in uh, Airflow for the data pro, first thing we do is we create a class of hook, data pro hook, which implements the same methods uh, which uh, cluster controller client does. But we are adding just a small amount of uh, additional logic like authentication, authorization, logging, exception handling just a minimal layer that will help us to work with the method in the context airflow. And then we create the operators. And as we can see, for each hook method, we have uh, at least one operator because each operator in airflow should have single responsibility. Like if these operators do things, uh, one thing, it should do exactly this one thing. There should be no if uh, clauses in the operation, like create or delete clause. Uh, yes. One, one comment, I, I'll just add to that. Like why hooks and operators separately? Like one thing Tom had mentioned that uh, we don't want to repeat 
uh, ourselves in the operator itself, but it also allows you to uh, several different operators to use the same hook. And this is this is an important thing. For example, for those transfer operators, um, you can have like GCS to AWS uh, operator, and if you use it, you will use both hooks, hook from Google Cloud Platform and from AWS. But then you can have another like AWS to Azure, and it will again use the same hook to communicate to AWS and hook to communicate to Azure. So this way we can facilitate reuse of the code for communication with those services in different operators. Yes, and the next question is how do tests communicate between uh, the tasks in, in Airflow Commons? So, for example, we have uh, three tasks, and uh, let's say that the first task is executing an operation that will leave uh, a file on Google Cloud Storage. So, a CSV file is created, and we want to reference this file in the next task after the, the first. And to, to do this, uh, Airflow has a idea of XCOM, which is a table uh, for storing results from task. And it's a key value table where the key is a composite key, which consists of DAG ID, task ID, execution date, and the key under which the value is uh, Safe. And, so, and one comment here, Tom. Yep. So the, the execution date name might be a little bit misleading. This is actually, a, it's not the date when it was executed. It is the date of the data interval that we are processing. As I mentioned before, we have data intervals in Airflow, and each data interval has unique date, uh, which is connected to this particular time interval. And this means that, for example, if you do this backfill that Tom had mentioned before, for the same data interval, execution date will stay the same. It will not be the, the date when you execute it like a few days later. It will be the date that the data interval date, uh, data interval that you identifies the data interval that you are, you are working on. Yeah. Yes. So uh, first has created the, the file and the question is how you can uh, access reference this file in the uh, next task so uh, we are doing this using uh, Jinja templates which is a t t templating language uh, in Python so let's assume that the task 3 uh, needs a parameter which is called bucket name it's a string and in the time of writing the DAG, we don't know what will be the value of the uh, file on the uh, bucket, and it will be created after the execution of first task. So to reference this task, we are using the Jinja templates, which uh, does uh, XCOM pull method, which will take the value from the XCOM table and will be uh, evaluated during the execution of the task three uh, to the value of uh, GCS URL. The interesting thing uh, is that we can, that, that the operator can uh, return many values uh, in the XCOM table. So for example, we can, um, like in this example, we can return the Data set ID, for example, we were creating some data sets, so we uh, we are returning the uh, uh, name and ID of this data set. But we can also return, for example, the number of rows in uh, in this data set or table. Yes, and now Yarek will uh, tell us more about uh, how tasks are executed in Airflow. Yeah, as I mentioned before. Uh, Airflow works equally well on a, on a local machine of your local development. You have a special development environment, even very easy to set up, in less than 10 minutes and you have it set up, and you can run Airflow on your own machine very easily with Docker Compose. Uh, but it also can run on a, on a cloud or on a, on a huge number of, uh, uh, of nodes in case you have a really complex and uh, many tasks to execute and uh, many teams working on them, then you can scale out single Airflow instance almost to infinity. Like, I'm exaggerating, of course, I mean, but you can scale it out quite a lot. And how it is actually done, this is done via executors. 
So you have those DAGs, you have tasks inside those DAGs, uh, and there are, there is a scheduler, which is part of Airflow as well, which schedules the whole workflows with regular intervals. But once the task is scheduled, which means that it is inserted into a database in, in, in a special table, uh, executors start, uh, start working. And their main task is to distribute the execution of tasks. So each task, and this is super important, each task is treated separately and in isolation. So the tasks, the only way tasks can communicate with, with each other is via ISCO, what Tomek explained. You cannot assume that those tasks are executed on a single machine. They might be executed on completely two different machines on two other sides of the world, uh, almost. Uh, but uh, so 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 executor is really there. Just it looks like it, it. It just takes okay. Now execute the task, and I find the right place to execute it and execute it. Um, and uh, inside the uh, whenever you run the task inside, uh, there is a task runner which provides this isolation on a process level. So even if you have one machine and run many, many different tasks on the same machine, they don't interact with each other. They are isolated, per perfectly isolated. Well, well, maybe not perfectly. They are not isolated on a container level as many different solution, solutions do. They are uh, isolated on a process level of, of Python, which is both good and bad, Like because it's not a perfect isolation. That's a bad thing. But good thing is just it's fast. You can develop. Uh, uh, you can you can easily iterate with that with Python. You don't have to prepare special images for containers to run your task tasks. It's just a script, a Python script that you that you have. Uh, so we have this process uh, separation, and those Python those executors are Python centric. So they are basing all the isolation on Python mechanism, not on the generic container mechanisms. Mm. A few executors. So starting from the very simple debug executor, it runs a single task in single process. Yeah, that's for debugging. And you can run it and debug it as usually when you debug Python code. This is something that we introduced as part of our work with with one of our uh, friend companies uh, called Databand AI. Uh, they contributed this debug executor to us so that we can contribute. Or they they they, they showed this to us so that we can contribute it to. Uh, to our flow community, and we did. Uh, there is a local executor, which is uh, already production and use, used in production. When you have big machine with many uh, uh, processors, for example, you can distribute your load between those processors and run many tasks in parallel, and that's what a local executor does. Uh, we have Celery executor. If you are not familiar with Celery, this is a, a queue. Uh, Execution queue mechanism, uh, which is very Python, Pythonic, and used in Python environment, and it, it works very well, and it can execute those uh, workflows on multiple machines. You just have to configure your Celery cluster of machines, and it will run on on, on, on many of those. And uh, finally, we have a Kubernetes executor, which spawns a new pod for each Airflow uh, task, uh, which is a bit uh, heavy. You know, if you have small tasks, uh, Kubernetes executor is not your best bet. Uh, it's better if you uh, if you have bigger tasks and execute there. Actually, Celery executor is the well, here is a short summary of the capabilities. So, debug executor is not uh, suitable for production, uh, and it, but it's simplest. Uh, local executor is simple. And it also used, if you can start using it for production, then Kubernetes executor is a somewhat complex, but not as much because it's just a pod submission to existing Kubernetes cluster. It's good for production, but it's not perfect. Uh, and Celery executor is like the most complex to set up because you have to have the Celery queue deployed for you, but also it's best suitable for all the production users that, that you can imagine. So this is our default and recommended uh, executor for all production users because it's it's proven. It's been like we tried to replace it with other solutions and failed. I mean, like Celery is so good. Uh, it turns out they solved so many problems that solving them again is not a good idea. And and, and we decided even if we wanted to drop Celery at some point of time, we decided to keep it because it's so good. Mm. Uh, now Tomek will tell about the execution and scheduling. Yeah. 
Yes, so uh, now we know that uh, the tasks are executed, can be executed in uh, different ma machines in different places. But what is the process behind scheduling the task? Because Airflow is all about scheduling and making tasks to be executed on the right time. So we have scheduler, and scheduler is a process that, first of all, run a duck parser sub process. And this subprocess is looking for the DAC files, the Python files that includes your workflow definitions, and it creates DAC ones. And from single DAC file, you, you, the DAC parser will create a lot of DAC ones because the DAC run is uh, the entity representing the run of your DAC for a given execution day for the given interval of data. So, for example, in this case. We see that the uh, DAC parser subprocess will create a DAG run for each 15-minute uh, interval. Then, when we have the DAG runs created, uh, the main process, the main loop of scheduler is looking for the DAG runs in the database. And if there is a task, if there is a DAG run which should be executed now or in the near future, like few seconds, then the scheduler takes this DAG and creates tasks which are related with this DAG and this diagram and sends them to the executors. And in the meantime, it also updates the whole state of the airflow and the executors. And here is the uh, overall architecture of the airflow. So at the base level, we have uh, database and we have the DAG folder, also the logs. Uh, then we have a web server, which need access to the database and DAC folder, and then we have web UI. And beside we have uh, the scheduler, which is probably the most important part of the airflow. Scheduler reads from database and DAC folder, sends the tasks to the executor, and the executor sends the, those tasks to the workers. And as Yarek mentioned, the workers can be uh, different machines, uh, different pods, so you can, uh, for example, have a really distributed environment of Airflow on your GKE cluster, on the Kubernetes cluster, or, for example, on multiple virtual machines. So uh, this is really interesting because uh, it means that you have to think in a distributed manner, because if you will create a file, you have to store it in the external service, not on the machine where the airflow, when the task is executed, because you are not sure if the next task after this one will be executed at the same time. But that's why we have the XCOM, um, uh, we have the XCOM uh, idea to, to make this work. Mm -hmm. And now shortly about the best practices. Yeah. So uh, something we mentioned before, uh, it's a little bit of rec recap from, from the intro in, that I've done at the beginning. So when it's good to use Airflow and when it's good to use some other workflow processing tools. So first of all, data intervals. This is something that is super important. Airflow is shines really when you have data intervals. The UI, the way how you manage backfills, the, the way how you manage your data is, is really uh, centered around those data intervals. Though we know people who are using Airflow to like build CI uh, jobs and <laughs> set up infrastructure, uh, it's possible, but the, it's not the best tool for that. Uh, uh, scheduling, so when you have a regular processing of those data intervals uh, every day, every hour, every 15 minutes, that's where Airflow is really good. Uh, then in case you have a combination of both data workloads and infrastructure setup, because Airflow is like, while it focuses on data intervals, it also can very well set up infrastructure, like create clusters, create services, open services, enable them, etc., etc. And we have all the operators, uh, lots of operators to do that. So when you have joint workload and infrastructure, uh, then Airflow is very good because you can manage the whole uh, the whole setup for processing and tear down and this is this is really powerful because there are a lot of uh, a lot of tools uh, for example Uzi which are barely focused on, on on 
processing the data. They, they, they will not set up the infrastructure in any way. Um, and they only focus on Hadoop cluster, which is already there. But if you have a service, if you have a cloud, and you can want to set up something and tear it down, then Airflow is really uh, great for that. Uh, also, I mentioned before teamwork. So Airflow allows you to distribute the work uh, on both writing, like distribute the work on writing the DAGs, so everyone can write their own DAGs. They are independent from each other. You can develop them separately, and you can schedule them separately, and uh, Airflow will handle hundreds and thousands of them if needed, so your team can be really big, and you have many people doing that. Uh, but also, uh, on the other hand, you have this very small team of operate, operate, people operating it and managing uh, the whole Airflow instance. Uh, they are different people. Um, and uh, this is where uh, the teamwork also stands to another team, because those two teams, or the DAC creation data scientist usually, and, and managed people like DevOps kind of people, they can very easily cooperate because the Airflow provide, provide this common language for them to talk. Yeah, so like data scientist provides the, that those DAGs written in a standard form, and uh, those DevOps guys they will take the DAGs, they will run them, and they will know what to do when it fails, when part of it fails, how to rerun it because this is all standardized. So you don't have to. So the, the cooperation is really smooth in this case. We don't. Those guys don't know how to manage it. And the, 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 like, the data scientists, they don't know anything about managing Kubernetes cluster. On the other hand, uh, the operations guys don't know anything about creating the uh, this or part, interacting with this particular data. But the result of data scientists can be perfectly used by those DevOps guys to manage and operate that at scale. Um, the other tools which are there are better in, uh, for example, processing the actual data. The Airflow doesn't process any data. It's a conductor, as I mentioned before. Uh, Airflow doesn't do streaming at all. So people are asking, how can I use the streaming uh, for Airflow? And uh, if you look at the readme of Airflow, one of the first sentences is, Airflow is not a streaming solution. Full stop. And it, yeah, it does the job well for batch and, uh, uh, and data interval processing, but it doesn't do streaming. There are many concepts which are not re relevant to uh, info, many concepts from streaming which are not relevant to to, to what Airflow does. Uh, heavy computing is usually not done by Airflow, although Tomek will tell you in a moment. Uh, some way how you can use heavy computing tasks with Airflow. Usually, the, the nodes of Airflow are small. They are not. They don't have GPUs. They they, they are just merely to uh, submit something and wait, and you know, like maybe poll for some results. So they are not very computationally expensive, and you can have many many tasks run on on, on single machine, usually. Uh, and it's not very well suited if you are just an individual or like a small company. Because it's it's a bit heavy, like you have to set it up. The production environment, the, the salary setup is fairly complex, uh, so it doesn't really make sense to start when it's when you have small needs. Uh, it's better when you are growing, and you write those bash scripts or whatever. Then switching to Airflow at some point of time when you are big enough is is, is your best bet. And Tomek will tell about those heavy uh, workloads uh, in a moment. Yes, so uh, as Eric mentioned, uh, the Airflow should not perform any uh, heavy workloads. It should schedule those uh, workloads in the external server. One of the interesting approaches, uh, for example, for learning machine learning models or processing a lot of data which requires a very uh, complex process, which will run in one place, is to create this data process and then dockerize it and then run it as a pod on the Kubernetes cluster. This, of course, requires the, the cluster under the hood. But interesting part in this uh, in this approach is that we can schedule the dockerization and running as a pod using Airflow. So, for example, you can have your uh, data process in the uh, GitHub repository, and then you are just dockerizing it and running this as a pod uh, using Airflow. The, one of the most interesting uh, advantage of this approach is that in this way you can define what resources will be given to this pod on the Kubernetes cluster. So for example, if you're learning, uh, you, when you're teaching the machine learning model, then train uh, the machine learning model, then you can request, for example, many GPUs, 
uh, few CPUs or any memory requ requirements that are necessary to do this process uh, efficiently. Uh, the other thing uh, we want to talk now is uh, the custom operators. Just quickly, what you should uh, remember when creating the uh, new operators for the airflow. So first of all, it's super easy. It's just pure Python. It's as easy as writing DAX. So if you are writing DAX, you should be able to write uh, custom operators because it's just defining the uh, Python class. Uh, try to uh, follow the hook and the operator approach because uh, it's much more extendable. And once you decide to contribute, for the example, your code to the community, uh, we will require this anyway. Uh, yes, remember that the operator should resemble the interface of the API you are going to integrate with. This will help your uh, peers and any other people, uh, any other, other person that will have to work with those operators. And uh, finally, uh, assure that they are either important. This, really, this is really important because otherwise you will face a lot of problems with uh, backfilling those DAGs and uh, even running the DAX normally. Oh, yeah, and one last point which is really important and we had a lot of problems with that is that do not call database or any other service, external service, in the constructor of the operator because the when you define the DAC file the and you invoke those classes, uh, the, the, those operators, the DAC parser subprocess is parsing those files, the DAC files, every few seconds. And in this process, we are invoking this class. So we are constructing this class, and anything that is in constructor will be executed. And if you are calling the database in constructor of the operator, it means you will call the database every few seconds, and that is not the best idea. Mm -hmm. So one last thing, uh, uh, we are both contributors to Airflow, uh, committers, PMC. Uh, we are the lucky ones that in our, our company is actually uh, has customers, uh, is supporting uh, those customers want to pay us for basically full-time contribution to Airflow, which is not very uh, uncommon on one hand, but a lot of people are also contributing in their free time. Besides, like we are also like so much involved in the project that we are contributing a lot in our free time anyway. Uh, you might find us every every time on every time of the day and night. Uh, you will find some of us contributing, but it's great if other people can contribute as well. Uh, and we have a lot of people contributing, even small things from time to time, uh, and it's super easy. Although, like the whole environment is complex, but it's easy to set up. So we dev like that was my part mostly. I created a really nice development environment for Airflow, which is called Breeze. Like this, uh, this uh, tagline, it's a breeze to contribute to Airflow. It's like you know, Breeze and Airflow, they are all connected. Uh, Airflow is open source, and we have great community of people, and you can learn a lot of from them. It's like it's, it's really fun to work with the community. Uh, uh, we have a lot of uh, a lot of uh, a good sense of humor. Uh, if you can look at some of the comments at uh, uh, at our GitHub, you, you will find some interesting uh, things in there uh, and funny. Uh, it's also fun because if you are using Airflow, contributing back is also a good idea because you are, you can use it for free. I mean that's a brilliant piece of software and you can use it for free. So why not? contribute a little bit back and especially if you're developing something uh, on your own it's much cheaper to contribute back to community because then com com community will keep on maintaining it and next time when you have a new version of airflow your changes will be contributed back and you will be able to use it without any kind of backporting or converting your, your own changes to airflow and that happens a lot we, we, we see a lot of people contributing their own code uh, the community is really welcoming. Uh, we have lots of meetups and workshops all over the place. Like few of them, we we run in Polydia. We run regular workshops, and 
they are now online. You can join <laughs> from Mexico or from whatever because they are online the same way as everyone else in the world. Uh, uh, so last uh, last event we had like hundred people uh, listening to them or participating in the in our meetup, uh, Airflow meetup. We do some workshops uh, uh, online. They are not that good as in person, but still we try to do that and maybe we'll organize some uh, in our upcoming uh, Airflow Summit that we are preparing together with uh, with Mara and Pedro, so they are helping us and that's, they invited us here to talk, so thank you for the invitation again. Uh, and we are going to have the whole summit, five days probably of talks uh, only about summit uh, Airflow and doing some maybe workshops, so uh, everyone is invited. Uh, so join the community and see what happens and uh, we will be announcing soon uh, a lot of information and you can contact us and there is uh, uh, you can you can also tell like uh, Tomek you are running the Apache local chapter as well yes yeah so yes uh, I'm in, involved in coming in the open source community science journey and I really enjoy this especially as a young person so I really encourage everyone to, 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 to do this. And as Yarek mentioned, we are running something which is called Apache Local Chapter, which is local community of open source enthusiasts related to the Apache Software Foundation. So thank you. And I think we have a few minutes for questions.